people talk a lot about Ukraine and whether or not they can ever win mm -hmm. and the shift to positional versus maneuverable warfare and that it's grinded to a halt. Do you think that, two questions. One is, do you think that Ukraine has been allowed to fight as much as they'd want to? Mm -hmm. Have they been enabled by the West? And two, if they were enabled more by the West, do you think they would make more progress on the battlefield? They have not, they have fought like wolves with, with what they've had. The West slow walked a lot of equipment to them at the beginning, and that was to their detriment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I could say like, hey, if we had given them this amount of equipment, this amount of whatever, uh, things would be different. But while we're dreaming, I want a pony. I can't go back and I can't change that stuff, right? We, we deal, we have the army, like, like Donald Rumsfeld said, we go to war with the army we have and with the army we want, mm -hmm. or we wish we had, right? Um, that was kind of number one. Number two, could they take back their land? I think they could. I don't see Ukraine winning in the sense of there is a ceremony on a battleship, uh, you know, in, the, in Moscow, right? I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. What I see is, I, th I think it's certainly possible that if Ukraine can destroy the Kerch Strait Bridge, it makes Russia's position in Crimea untenable. That bridge is the thing connecting the east part of Crimea to the land and the- To the land, yep. yeah, okay. to Russia proper. Yeah. So it's a bridge. And they that, could retake Crimea in your mind if they has, could get that bridge. They can t if they can take that bridge down, then it's going to be a lot harder for Russia to, to move supplies. One of the things Ukraine is amazing at is what's called shaping operations, right? So you're trying to shape the battlefield, and they're really good at that. If they can take out, I think this year it will be the year they do it. They take okay. out the bridge. What does that look like? Sorry, I'm yeah. sorry to be so pedantic. No, but no, when no. you say like shaping operations, it mm -hmm. sounds really interesting. Like I think of like a couple of like the stories of like Ukrainians, like like the one Ukrainian man like risking his life to blow out that important bridge, mm -hmm. um, pretty early on, like almost almost two years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about shaping operations, what does yeah. that actually mean? Like what is the military? What is Ukraine doing that's unique that makes them? as you say, kind of shape the battlefield okay. in the way that they want it. So the shaping operation uh, sets up the victory conditions for the future. So blowing up bridges, stuff like blowing that. Blowing up bridges, stuff like that. And instead of worrying about stuff on the tactical level, they've also had other teams blow up Russian oil refineries or try to destroy ships. Mm. And each one of these things is a pinprick that makes it harder for Russia to supply and to fight. Okay. So what I see is that I think Ukraine could cut off Crimea. And at that point, now we enter negotiations. Does Ukraine take back the Donbass and Crimea? I don't think so. You think it's more likely that they could take back Crimea versus the Donbass? Maybe. Because I feel like Russia would be more incentivized because of Sevastopol and everything to protect Crimea and their entry to the uh, Black Sea versus... I mean, the, they can want it all they want. When they have the, the, the lift to supply troops there uh, via, via the ocean, that's, that's another story. Right, but I think if you can cut off Crimea and you can you can draw a wedge between uh, the Donbas and Crimea, then what you have is an end to operations, and Ukraine is now negotiating from a position of strength instead of weakness. Do I see them capturing, killing every single Russian in the Donbas, Zaporizhia, and Crimea? No, but I think they could force Russia's hand, go to the negotiating cable from a position of strength. And what I see, honestly, is a peacekeeping force made up of uh, various, maybe non-aligned nations. Maybe you see like India and Bangladesh and Fiji and these nations, they create a peacekeeping force inside Crimea and the Donbass. But that might be some kind of A zone, B zone, C zone mm -hmm. of, you know, Ukraine is allowed to have a certain number of tanks here. Russia is allowed to have a certain number of tanks here. And the the uh, peacekeepers enforce that and ukraine doesn't necessarily get their land back but they get to open up trade and you routes. think you think they reasonably could do that in crimea if we unlocked the the we're going to unlock the f-16 soon that is okay that's true and that you know with the f-16 what do you have we that's have their dominance jet? it's a jet absolutely mm -hmm. correct it's a jet so the f-16 is a jet that america authorized i think it was belgium and uh denmark and when you say unlocked, does that mean that they will just have access to the F-16? They'll have access. The and F they've got their pilot. I think they're training now on they're them, right? They're training now. Mm -hmm. And with the, with the F-16, you have the what's called the AMRAM missile, the AM-120. And this is a long-range missile. Nothing Ukraine has now can, can go as far as that missile. Now, Russia has longer-range missiles, but it's going to force Russia to pull back. 
and you got to pull back even further, right? Just to also to mm -hmm. clarify this, because I didn't even realize this until like months ago. Um, I thought that when planes shot missiles, I thought that it was within a mile at most when they're shooting at each other. But when we say miles long range away. missiles, yeah, I think like 10, 20, miles, 30, think? oh, yeah. okay, 88 miles. Yeah, these are planes they can shoot. So two planes are shooting at each other 80 miles away. Not yeah, necessarily never planes, see each but other. Air, to, uh, air to surface that you can fire at mm -hmm. targets okay. from. Yeah. Yeah. Two planes, they, they might, uh, you'd have your AWACS, which is that airborne early warning control system. The balloons? Uh, the, uh, well, it, it, well, that's PTIDs, oh, close. Damn. That's fine. So, all right, did you ever see the movie Independence Day? No. Yeah, okay. Well, there was an AWACS Independence Day. It's a little rotating radar dome on it. Okay, okay. Yeah, and so that plane might be flying, and it tells the fighters, okay, you got bad guys. They're 120 miles away. Uh, turn to uh, you know, climb to Angels 30. Turn to uh, 8 zero, and you know, you'll be able to pick them up on your radar, and then these planes will be able to fire. Sometimes the planes won't even know that they're being targeted. Right? Right. They'll, they'll know when they're illuminated, right? But some, I think some missiles like the AMRAAM, you can actually fire, and then it's, it's self-guiding radar turns on a little bit later. Do you think Ukraine has the necessary coordination to operate that plane in an active military theater? They will. They don't, they don't now. Okay. They I mean, like they're, so they're doing deconfliction, too. They're doing deconflict. Actually, they're actually pretty good at it because right now, with the way things are in Russia, they have a lot of ground controllers that are using ground radar to figure out where Russia is. Because right now, when when uh, Russia will fly these combat air patrols, and they'll fly them over their territory. And when they see a Ukrainian helicopter pop up, they'll vector fighters toward that. They'll start firing missiles. Well, the ground control the Ukrainians will see that and will tell the helicopter, get down on the ground right now. And they'll... Down. That's why they can't do medevac, right? I mean, Russia will just shoot them down. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think they can. But with that F-16, you can establish your dominance. Mm -hmm. And if you establish your dominance, the next thing you have are anti-radiation missiles. So these are missiles that go after the radar of the surface-to-air missile radar sets. That are shooting down, like, planes. And that something. are shooting down planes. The HARM anti-radiation missile. They, we, they were able to, like, cobble together kind of like a, a little uh, trailer park Am uh, trailer park um, uh, harm launcher on, on some of their jets, on their, uh, their uh, MiG-29s. They're able to, to fire those things. And now you have integrated sensors on the F-16 that can do, uh, as soon as they see that radar illuminate, they can find it and shoot it. Right, right. now, I think they have to go after pre-planned targets. They have to pro the load, load the software beforehand. Mm -hmm. But now with the F-16, the integrated operation system, you can say, oh, that thing just popped up, fire a missile at that radar. So now, what do the Russians have to do? They have to pull back further. So now there's surface air missile batteries to pull back further. Now people at the front are exposed. Now we get into the JDAM, the Joint Direct Attack Munition. There's another acronym. <laughs> All right, so now you got the JDAM. And the JDAM and the JDAM ER, they are these, uh, ER means extended range. So like a little bomb that you drop and fins pop out and it glides to its target, right? So now they can use these JDAMs against Russian positions on the front line, and they can do it free from surface-to-air missile fire, free from harassing fire from Russian fighters. Because of the ra radio emission, whatever. Yeah, called. well, they fire the anti-radiation missiles at radiation, the same launchers. Yeah. They pulled them back, and now they have all right. Now they have battle space dominance in the air. To go so back now. to the video game thing I said yesterday, that if you have one hole in your defense, if there mm -hmm. is a hole that slowly starts to open up every other part of the battlefield and you lose everything, essentially. Now you got those JDAMs coming it's down. the difference of the parity between offensive and defensive. Mm -hmm. the qu that Russia obviously knows this is coming. The F-16 yeah. is no secret. I think they're supposed to have those systems online, I think, the second half of this year. Yeah, where I think we're coming. Be. So should what be. is Russia's counterplay to this? Certainly they're not just going to pull back and watch everything fall apart. There has to be some... They're probably going to surge as many aircraft in the air as possible and try to get a political victory. Look, it's not that hard to shoot down a uh, F-16. F-16, but here's here's the disadvantage. How long have they been flying those jets? About two years now. They've been riding them hard, right? Oh, the Russian side jets. You, you, they You're talking about like pilot attrition or? No, well, pilot attrition, but maintenance. Oh. Oh, okay. So how long have they been riding those jets hard? Or right? the F-16s. So how many maintenance cycles have they missed? When we talk about um, we talk about numbers of aircraft, is it has it been stated? It must be. How many F-16s are the Ukrainians getting? I think it's forty-eight. Forty-eight. What 48, is the size 44. of like Russia's air force for like planes that can shoot big. down F-16s? <laughs> like in the <laughs> very big, like tons of hundreds or? Um, I want to say three to five hundred, but they're they're not all operational at the same time. Okay. So Do you, you think... might have a, a sortie rate 
Like you, you might be able to generate 50%. Okay. So why would the maintenance be missed if they have such a massive field of airplanes? It goes back to that cost thing. Yeah. It's yeah. just money? They just can't afford I mean, to maintain it's them? It's money. Look, when you, uh, I've always said the F-16, when you fly the F-16, it's eight hours of maintenance for every one hour of flight. Now that doesn't mean you fly for one hour, you gotta put it down, you work in eight hours of maintenance. Like it's it's cumulative, right. right? But there are certain cycles that you have to hit where you're like, hey, um, all right, we, we hit our 40 hour maintenance cycle, we have to do the joke program, we have to take out the oil, we have to replace this thing or that thing or whatever. Uh, and different maintenance cycles take different amounts of time. So Russia's been flying these jets for a certain number of hours, and I'm sure a lot of them are in, especially their Su-34s, which are their bombers. Um, a lot of them are in uh, a maintenance cycle where like, they, they could be coming up on their, like, uh, they call it D-level maintenance, which is like your, your depot level. You know, you gotta bring the plane it's, back to the depot. Just bring deep cleaning of Yeah, them. they gotta deep clean it, right? They gotta change all this stuff, they gotta inspect, they gotta x-ray all the wings to see if there's any cracks in them. So they've been doing that for you know, two years, flying these things, and then the Ukrainians are getting fresh jets. They're not, they're not new, they're not showroom new. They're, it's like getting a used car from Hertz, right? right? You, know, you bought the used car after Hertz sells it after a year, right? So they're getting these older jets, but at least they're fresh, and they, they're, they're refurbished, factory refurbished. Right. So the Ukrainians have a temporary advantage against Russia just because their jets don't need to get into that deep cycle maintenance that the Russians are already in. Okay, going back to your question, do you remember what we were about to ask him? Um, no, it was, it was basically on that. I also wonder, do you think that for the training uh, for the F-16 system, mm -hmm. do you think they're going to be able to participate in like air-to-air -air stuff or is it just gonna be those F-60s are gonna be protected exclusively by things on the ground and then these planes are gonna be grounded if Russia tries to shoot them down? That's a good question. I think that they might get into air-to-air -air stuff because they'll be able to push out. And I also wonder um, how the Russians will deal with them because as far as I know, we've, other than Iraq in the in Operation uh, Operation Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. I'm really trying to think of a situation where Russian MiGs tangled with F-16s. And mm -hmm. I'm sure there's people who are watching the stream right now going, what about Chile? Or, yeah, so, you know, I, I, I'm just mm -hmm. really trying to think. But I think during the first Gulf War, that was really the first time we tried to engage in any air-to-air -air combat with, with Russian MiGs. Yeah. Although I'm tr trying to think of even, like, shooting down a mm -hmm. U.S., F-16 yeah. that's participating in like combined arms mm -hmm. warfare with the whole U.S. military it might be significantly harder than shooting down an F-16 from a Ukrainian military that doesn't have the same type of. So that that could be it could be easier to shoot down that Ukrainian plane because maybe they're not doing those multi-domain operations, mm -hmm. right? They don't necessarily have everything. Uh, but uh, if you're talking about pilot to pilot, you know one of the one of the things that's kind of on the Russian side is that it's unknown. Like what what are we dealing with here? We've never no one's ever actually fought an F-16, right? Mm. No, no Russian pilot ever has, right? So how do we how do we deal with this threat? Did Iraq even have an Air Force? Yeah, they yeah, did. we okay. destroyed it. Okay, <laughs> all right. You know, but it, for a couple of days, they gave it the old <laughs> college try, and they actually sent quite a few planes to Iran, which Iran kept. Okay. You know. Gotcha. Hmm.